Hi, and welcome back to To Think Minimum. It's Friday, December 11th, 2020. I'm Scott Walston, President and Senior Fellow at the Technology Policy Institute. I'm here with Sarah O, oh, Senior Fellow at TPI, and today we're with Greg Roston. Greg is the Gordon Kane Senior Fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and Director of the Public Policy Program at Stanford. He served as Deputy Chief Economist at the Federal Communications Commission, working on implementing the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and helped design and implement the first ever spectrum auction in the United States. He co-chaired the Economy, Globalization, and Trade Committee for the Obama campaign and was a member of the Obama transition team focusing on economic agency review and energy policy. He received his PhD in economics from Stanford and his AB in economics from Berkeley. Among his many extracurricular activities, he also serves as an advisory board member for Sustainable Conservation and the Nepal Youth Opportunity Fund. Greg, thanks for joining us. Sure, great to be here and thanks for having me. So before we start this, I should I'll tell people that the first time we interacted was in 1990, I think it was 1995. And when I was at the council, I was a, just a staff economist at the Council of Economic Advisors. And Greg, you were at the FCC working on these spectrum auctions. And at the council, we wrote a chapter on telecommunications and mentioned auctions. And I wrote in a draft, I said something like, it's not the details that matter. It's the fact that we're having auctions. That's a really big deal. And somebody at the FCC wrote back, who is this idiot who wrote this thing? <laughs> and I was that idiot. And the person who wrote that was Greg. <laughs> so I'm sure I didn't use that harsher language, but it, it was <laughs> But the sentiment I, was there. Yes. When I left a consulting firm to go to the FCC to work on auctions, one of the principals who shall remain nameless of this consulting firm, who's a fairly esteemed economist, said, What's the point of going to do that? You just put stuff up for sale and that's it. You know, this is not going to be a big deal. It's not a big complicated thing and you won't be doing much. I think he was extremely wrong. And I think the details do matter about not only auction design, but much more importantly, spectrum policy. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's right. We've seen that now in many of the auctions. But that's, I mean, that sort of raises an interesting question. When you were working on these first auctions, and I, I know there was a group of you working on them, was there still opposition to doing it? Or even sort of on the opposite side, people who thought this really isn't a big deal and it'll be easy? And why are you spending so much time on it? Yeah, so this was an incredibly big deal. You know, obviously, people had talked about auctioning spectrum for a long time. We moved from beauty contests to finally to lotteries and then finally to auctions with the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993 gave authorization for auctions and they gave an incredibly short time frame. But one of the things that happened was Evan Correll. Mm -hmm. Evan, I believe, should have been part of the recent Nobel Prize that was awarded to, rightly so, to Bob Wilson and I Paul agree. Milgram. But without Evan, the spectrum auctions would have been done very, very differently. One of the things that Evan did was at the FCC, there's a notice of proposed rulemaking. And what Evan did was he put in footnotes to lots of the auction theory in the NPRM. This had never been done. And so what happened was when the FCC representatives of AirTouch and AT&T and the other companies that were thinking of Pacific Bell were thinking about uh, the auction and getting Spectrum, they read these footnotes and they said, oh my gosh, we got to hire these people. And so they hired Pacific Bell, hired Bob Wilson and Paul Milgram, AirTouch hired Preston McAfee, other companies hired Peter Crampton and Bob Weber, and all the auction theorists put in proposals. Barry Nailbuff was also in there, and they put in very different proposals about how to run the auctions. And Evan held a conference of academics, and we got submissions from all these economists about how it should be done. And luckily, this was a place where the firm said, we don't know how this is really going to work, but we think we're the most efficient provider. So we want to have an efficient auction. And it was relatively efficient, but some of them did have much bigger aims and some had smaller aims. So it mattered how big the licenses were and in what order you auction them. And it turned out that auctioning them all at the same time was the best answer. And Evan, you know, there were details that really, really mattered. For example, one of the things that Paul and Bob think about is called the Milgram-Wilson activity rule. And that wasn't part of their original proposal. But Evan said, if you don't make people bid, they can hide in the grass like people do in EBA auctions and snipe and come in at the last second. And the last second will never happen. We won't get an efficient auction if we just declare an end and then people bid at the last second. So we want to get people to be active and reveal information and reveal prices throughout the course of the auction. And so he pushed Bob and Paul to come up with something different. And they did. And that was the basis of this activity rule that has formed the bedrock, to be honest, of auctions around the world. 
So those are some incredibly valuable footnotes that led to a Nobel Prize and auctions that just wouldn't have existed otherwise. Right, yeah. There was, I believe it was Senator Conrad Burns from Montana, was an auctioneer, a cattle auctioneer. And he was involved in telecom at the time as a senator. And he wanted us to hold oral outcry auctions like we were auctioning cattle for the Spectrum licenses. We actually held one oral outcry auction for what's called IVDS, and it turned out to be a disaster because people didn't think about the intersecting values and substitutes and complements in the way they could in the bigger auctions. So, I have a hard time imagining what that even looked like. How do you do an oral outcry auction for Spectrum? So there was Just a license by license? License by license in the ballroom of the Omni Shoreham Hotel. Wow. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, that's was, the way they do tobacco little, auctions. <laughs> It, it was exactly like that. And it was kind of it, the, it, the same week we held the first simultaneous multiple round auction for narrowband PCS, which was essentially a test case for the big broadband PCS auction. And that worked much better. Hmm. So there's a lot of talk about the auctions. And I think the auctions are incredibly important and useful. But one of the things that the auctions did was really cement in place the idea of flexibility for the licenses. And I think that that's probably... You know, while auctions are important and they generate revenue, I think the best answer would be if we held an auction and, and we were able to award the Spectrum at a price that was extremely low, because that would mean that Spectrum wasn't a scarce input anymore. Right. Well, I mean, that's a good point. Right? The auction is to try to get the starting point of the licenses in the most efficient place, and then that's going to change over time. And so if the licenses are flexible and you can sell them later, that will ensure you don't have to re-auction them constantly. Right. Yeah. This is so one of the things that the FCC was able to do was in the PCS auction, there were a small number of microwave incumbents that were using the spectrum that became the PCS spectrum. And the FCC effectuated a transfer where these licensees, the new licensees, had to take care of the old ones, either move them to new spectrum or give them fiber, somehow buy them out and move them. And there were enough small ones, and there was a backstop that said, well, if you don't agree, then we can move you. And the same thing in that same idea happened in the broadcast incentive auction, where the television stations could be bought out, but if they didn't, they could be forced to move to other channels. And that really allowed the FCC to transition spectrum from inefficient use, such as broadcasting or microwave, into more efficient, flexible use in wide area licenses. Auctions have been pretty much a bipartisan thing now at the FCC. They happen to happen in every FCC since Reed Hunt, I, I believe. Why has this particular policy been so popular? Do you think it's because of the revenues that it raises, even though that's not supposed to be the reason for auctions? Yeah, it, sort of, it is interesting. We didn't get auctions until 1993. Mm -hmm. And Evan Correll and I actually have a paper that talks about the first auctions. And one of the things we talked about was, how did we get there? And for years, Democrats, John Dingell, and Dan Inouye, who were influential telecom legislators, said, no way, auctions won't happen over my dead body. And then they took credit for creating the auction. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the best but way to get what, someone who's opposed on board, just give them credit. Yeah, but they, well, they took credit. I don't think they were given credit. <laughs> <laughs> they finally came around because before that, it was Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush as president. And they didn't want to give them money or credit for doing it. Mm -hmm. And they also had significant political capital with broadcasters. And so there's, I don't know if it's an apocryphal story or not, that somebody proposed auctions in the mid-1970s. And a broadcaster said to an advisor to President Ford, well, if you go forward with this, you might see a lot of videos of President Ford stumbling and tripping on the local news. And quickly that lost steam. I don't know if that's an apocryphal story, but there are political constraints. And in 1993, in OBRA 93, we had a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president, and there were PAYGO rules. So this freed up money and gave credit to a Democratic president from a Democratic Congress. And these people came along and we got to auctions that way. And now the money, I think, is what's going on next. And now it's, it's continuing because of the money. Yes. Hmm. That was a pretty important role. And there was a, it was a hugely important role for economics then to make this happen. And to continue developing it, it been up to the broadcast incentive auction, which is kind of an amazing development. This two-sided this two -sided auction that even involved machine learning, which wasn't necessarily part of the auction, but helped things run smoothly. How has the role of economics at the FCC changed, do you think, since those days? 
So I give a huge amount of credit to Reed Hunt, who was an antitrust lawyer before he came to the FCC and said, I want to have economics play an important piece of what we do. He had a slogan, t-shirts made that said, read the law, study the economics, do the right thing. And he wanted input from economists. Michael Katz was his first chief economist and then mm -hmm. Joe Farrell. And they both were not shy about disagreeing with the chairman, which was great. And I think that that's important to have a strong chief economist who is not afraid to disagree with the chairman and the chairman is not afraid to listen. I think that it ebbs and flows over time, depending upon who the chairman is and what they want to listen to in terms of economics. Sometimes it has more influence, sometimes it has less. And I think it really strongly depends on how the chairman and the chief economist interact and believe in things. What do you think about this of a new office of economics and analysis? Not necessarily the office exactly the way it is or the people in it, but sort of the idea of having all the economists in one place. I'm not sure. There are lots of different ways that things can work, and I am not an organizational expert on these things. I've thought about where people should be. Should the economists be sitting shoulder to shoulder with all the lawyers in the bureaus and develop a relationship and work closely with them as the thing gets on? Or should they be in a separate bureau and come in later and say, no, you didn't think about this right. You need to go back and change everything. Having a check, I think at the end is important, but I do think also that making sure that economists are involved earlier on really does make a difference in getting things going in the right direction and influencing them rather than having lawyers talk to lawyers and engineers talk to engineers and economists talk to economists. Along those lines, would you have advice along those lines for whoever is the next FCC chair? Well, I would strongly think they should have an economist as mm -hmm. you know their chief advisor. Oh, I thought uh, you were going to say as chair. That's <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we will be that lucky, I think. <laughs> But it is, you know, I've talked to different people who become chief economists and chief of OPP, OSP, whatever that OEA, to say, you know, make sure that you're in the room, like Hamilton, you know, who's in the room matters. Right. And developing the relationship, I, you know, as economists, I went to the FCC and I was much more naive than I am now, even though I'm pretty naive now, and could not understand why Reed Hunt was going out and giving lots of speeches. It was read the law, study the economics, do the right thing. But it was also convince other people, build political capital, mm -hmm. and try to get people on your side was something that he was doing, which I think turned out to be extremely important in making sure that the public and the firms and Wall Street supported the things that he did, especially with the Telecom Act, but also with Spectrum and making sure that things work. And these relationships matter. In economics, we don't model these things at all. But the relationship with the chief economist and the chair make a difference as to how much influence the chief economist will have. Where do you think the FCC can do better with economics? Like, are there new frontiers that the FCC should consider for more economic analysis? I think they made a big move which I think is going to change things to some degree. Again, it depends on how much people want to listen. But the role of cost-benefit analysis to sort of enshrine that in their rules was a really good move. I was advocating for this a while ago, and I thought that it was a good thing. You know, cost-benefit analysis has holes in it seven ways from Sunday. If you change the discount rate, what you count, how, you know, all these different things, but at least making it be part of the framework that you have to do and that then courts can review is really important because you can't hide the ball at nearly as much when you have to actually explicitly do a cost-benefit analysis. So I think that will be a big change that and it's going to be hard for the next FCC to say, well, we're going to write that out of the rules now that it's in the rules. I think it's a lot easier not to adopt it, but it's hard to say, no, cost-benefit analysis doesn't make sense. So I hope that they push that and really enshrine it and that the courts hold their feet to the fire to do a good job. I think that will be a big advance for the FCC. Do you think they will push forward on it? I mean, it's unfortunate, but it seems as if often Democrats believe that the main point of cost-benefit analysis is to block new regulations. I mean, obviously, as an economist, I think that's not what cost-benefit analysis is for at all. But there does seem to be this impression. And I worry that a, a new administration won't want to focus as much on cost-benefit analysis. Do you think that's an actual concern? I think it is definitely a concern that you that, that people won't listen to it as much, or they'll say, you need to do the cost-benefit analysis so you know, have the conclusion before the analysis. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that there's the analysis before the conclusion. Right. Policy-based evidence making. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Another issue, another thing that we, actually that we've all worked on is universal service and analyzing the programs, trying to improve the programs. Uh, 
What was your first paper on universal service and why did you do it? So I guess I did a couple of papers looking at the Telecom Act of 96, Mm -hmm. looking at universal service, you know, what did it do? But the first real research paper was with Brad Wimmer at UNLV. And we looked at how universal service programs affect, especially, we looked mainly at rural universal service programs. And we looked at the demographics or the, you know, how these programs split the revenues and costs among low and high income families or households. And we found that most of the money that went to rural areas went to relatively high income households. And that's not surprising as an economist. If we were thinking about universal service programs, we'd want to have money go towards low income households to households that wouldn't otherwise subscribe. And the Mm -hmm. rural universal service program has no test like that at all. And this was in late 1990s that we did this work, and it was about telephone service. But the lessons are still applicable in broadband. If you want to get bang for your buck, you want to give money to people who wouldn't otherwise subscribe. So, the, I mean, the lesson is clear. And like you said, this was for telephone service from a while ago. Do you think anyone's paid attention to that lesson? And have policies changed to address this problem? I think that... So first, a little self-deprecating comment, which is we did, a, I did another paper with Brad and with Dan Ackerberg and Mike Reardon, David Dreamer, where we looked at the universal service programs for telephone service, and we looked at Lifeline and LinkUp. Lifeline subsidizes the monthly rate and LinkUp subsidizes your hookup charge. And we found that the LinkUp program, the hookup charge, was much more effective on a cost-effective basis than Lifeline. And within... Roughly a month or two of our paper coming out, the FCC got rid of the link-up program. So that was not a great answer, we don't think, in terms of this. I do Hopefully think, not first, causal because of your paper. No, I don't think it was causal. I hope not. <laughs> I agree. But for example, people, there's, there's becoming more attention, especially over the last eight months, on low-income adoption and affordability. Derek Turner has written something recently from Free Press about universal service and going to think about the number of unconnected households in urban areas is much higher than the number of unconnected households in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And that's because of affordability, not because of availability. So I hope that things are going to change and push more towards, if we're going to connect people, let's do the Willie Sutton theory. The Willie Sutton theory was, why do you rob the banks? Because that's where the money is. Let's try and connect people because the people are in urban areas. So we need to make sure that people who have, have it can be connected. And it may be much, much cheaper to connect a lot of households in urban areas than connecting a lot of households in rural areas. It sounds like so far the FCC, the Universal Service Program, has also used the Willie Sutton theory, but kind of wrong. They also go where the money is, but that's where they subsidize. <laughs> right. So they've been doing, you know, for years and years and years, they subsidize rural areas. One of the things that they've started doing, we, in fact, you and I were both signatories to this, a group of economists pushed for using auctions to award universal service dollars. And the FCC has, over the past few years, done auctions to try to reduce the cost of providing service to rural areas. And that's, again, it's the auction is actually a pretty good way of doing things here I think the auction is really important of reducing the amount the FCC funds because the FCC doesn't really know what it costs to fund an area. So if they're going to fund areas, let's make it lower cost. Obviously, an even better solution will be to give these people who live in these rural areas vouchers and let them choose and have the market work more. But I don't think that that's viable at this point in time. What is the objection to vouchers? Because in lots of conversations, it comes up that that would be a good outcome, and yet it never happens. I mean, in a sense, maybe Lifeline is kind of a voucher because it goes with the person, but why is it not more popular? So I think this is a complicated issue because people, there are telephone companies that think this is their territory, and if you give somebody a voucher, they may use it some other way. I liked the example of, you know, should you give in rural areas fiber to the farmhouse or mobile service to the tractor? Is it better to have a gigabit service to the home or a hundred megabit service that can be used anywhere mobile? Some people may want it 
for their home. Other people may want it so that they can be mobile. And if you give vouchers, then somebody can choose. If you give subsidies and you say you have to provide gigabit service, the fiber is going to win. And the person who provides the fiber may object to having vouchers. So you're saying it's we're using fiber as the example, but it's pressure from those groups that prevent vouchers from happening. Right. Exactly. So that doesn't seem like it's, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of promise in overcoming that. I think that, you know, as you do the auctions that the FCC has done have given subsidies for a fixed period of time for build out. And I think that over time, once those subsidies end, there either will be their facilities built out and they just won't do any more, which is kind of the hope that they would only give low income subsidies beyond the 10 years of subsidy. And that would be great. But there also are possible things that could come in. For example, 5G service from wireless promises to cover 97, 98% of the country. Satellite service, if it works, could cover 100% of the country the moment it's up and running. So these things might not provide fiber service areas, but they might provide competition. And if they're cheaper or more flexible, providing other things, I think that's where the hope is for rural service. And you think these subsidies would go away if that happened? I mean, they should, but it's hard to, I mean, these are pretty popular subsidies. Yeah, if, you know, obviously somebody was pushing for, you know, some, I don't know who, but people were pushing for higher speeds. You keep hearing people talk about future proofing, we need fiber everywhere. But if these low earth orbiting satellites are really good, maybe that's going to be good enough. And the combination of them for some areas and 5G service for a lot of areas and fiber for a lot of areas could work out very well. I hate the concept of future proofing. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, it's all a matter of you know, how you, you know, what the net present value and net benefits are of your investment. I'm not sure I understand the concept. Are we trying to plan for things that may or may not happen and that we could invest in in the future? It just seems like adding a lots of costs that we don't necessarily need to add. I don't know if there's a better, you know, a good definition of future proofing that makes sense, but I don't know. That, that, that discussion always annoys me. But lots of things annoy me. Really, Scott? I didn't know that. <laughs> No, you're right. The discount rate is Mm -hmm, incredibly important. You know, should you, are you investing for the next 10 years, the next 50 years? But it could be that fiber is great for the next 10 years, but something is going to come along in 10 years that makes these satellites even better. Mm -hmm. And, And we may have wasted all this investment in fiber. We may not. Maybe the answer is not. But I don't think that anybody knows enough now to say that that's the right answer for the whole country. I don't want to send fiber to Ted Kaczynski's cabin because it's pretty remote and it's going to be really expensive to do that. And he's not there anymore. Well, that's true too, (laughs) but to his cabin. (laughs) Right. So on things that are not FCC, you're out in, you're at Stanford, Silicon Valley. And in DC, we talk about lots of policies and issues that affect tech. Right now, there are the, the cases against Google and Facebook and so on. How, I mean, you interact with venture capitalists and you know, students who start companies, and how do they see DC? I mean, what do they see us as? I think that's changed a lot over the last 20 years since I've been here. It used to be they didn't worry, they looked for, to some extent, they looked to DC for protection. If you are a tech company like Google or Facebook, you're not happy with tech regulation right now. Mm-hmm. If you are duck, duck, go, you want to make sure that there is regulation. But I think for the most part, there are VC companies, VC-backed companies, have a view that they either, you know, they want an exit. And the exit is either their dreams are going public or being acquired. And they're kind of indifferent in some sense on the money. I think they'd like to keep control. We just had Airbnb and DoorDash go public Mm -hmm. this week. I have two students who I think are very, very happy who have been at those two companies for a long time. And they are enough separate from what the tech regulators are focusing on right now that they're not worried about it. But if I were DoorDash right now is being pressured by Santa Clara County and San Francisco to limit the charges on delivery because the amount they charge restaurants. Yeah, so I think actually DoorDash all... just reached a settlement with uh, Washington, D.C. They had to pay like two and a half million dollars or something back to the city because of 
earlier charges or something. So yeah, cities are getting involved. Yeah, so regulation is important for them. It's important for Airbnb. It's important for nearly every company. So they need to worry about it. But most of these startups don't worry about it yet. And I think that's the right answer. But they do, you know, this is a question about, you know, Mark Lemley of the Stanford Law School and CEPR has a paper about exits. And if the exits are primarily to build up a company that then will be bought by one of the big tech companies, that's a very different way of thinking about your startup than if you're thinking about, I want to build a business that could be viable and is going to go public. You know, the, I mean, aren't the vast majority of startups purchased? I mean, it's the rare company that goes public, right? So I think the vast majority aren't purchased and don't go public. <laughs> right, right, exactly. They disappear completely. <laughs> um, so it's the lucky ones that are in those two categories. Right. And most of them are purchased. You're right. I think there are more. And they go in 1999, they were going public. More recently, they've been acquired. And a lot of them are, I want to abstract from what, what is termed the aqua hire, where you acquire a firm to get the six engineers. Those are more hiring talent than they are hiring a product. But there are a lot that get acquired to get a specific product or something that would be there. And the question is, are these acquisitions that are to stave off potential competitors? If they're going to be staving off potential competitors, I think that the tech companies are going to be playing whack-a-mole. That there will be, you know, if you start acquiring everybody who might be a competitor, then there are going to be a lot more companies poking their head up to try to get you to buy them. And this is a question, you know, part of the FTC's Facebook suit said, one of the remedies we want is that you have to notify us of any acquisition. Mm -hmm. And a lot of acquisitions fall under the Hart Scott Rodino filing notification. They're still subject to antitrust challenge, and there have been challenges to merge, in fact, unwinding of a merger. I believe it was a company called Bizarre Voice that was under the HSR filing, but the FTC still filed suit and caused the acquisition to be undone. But to require all these to be seen in advance, that doesn't seem like it's a huge burden on a company like Facebook with its size. And it may be a huge burden on the FTC to investigate every single one of Facebook's acquisitions. Right. there. I mean, that, and, but there were stories even recently about how the FTC doesn't have enough resources as it is. But you're also, I mean, what you said, though, kind of suggests a different theory of what acquisitions for the purpose of squashing competition would be. I mean, the FTC and others will argue that, you know, that this is an anti-competitive practice. Facebook buys firms to prevent competition. And you're saying that it'll cause more firms to pop up. You said it's like playing whack-a-mole. But if that's the case then their sole purpose of quashing competition could be a good thing, right? Because you're going to cause lots more firms to enter. Right. I mean, that would be right. a completely so is, different uh, response. Right. So I do think, I, you know, I, the question is, are they, for example, the Instagram purchase? Was Instagram mm -hmm. the only photo share? You know, this is something they, in addition to the FTC saying, oops, never mind to the earlier 5 nothing decision that they had to approve them. <laughs> right. <laughs> they need to say, and by the way, it is, there were... 10 other photo sharing sites at the time, but this was clearly and obviously the best one and they bought it just to stop competition from Instagram. The others died because they weren't as good or did they die because Instagram became much better as part of Facebook? It's going to be a tough job for the FTC to argue that this was obviously a wrong decision by the five commissioners of the FTC and it was obvious that Instagram was going to become great and the others were going to fail without a purchase of Instagram by Facebook. Has it ever happened before that the FTC has gone back to say an earlier decision was wrong and essentially invalidated it? So I'm not an FTC expert. I thought I read something about that yesterday, but I don't know. Oh, it sounds like it would be really unusual for the FTC to say, we're going to vote 5-0, but in 10 years, if you're very successful, <laughs> we'll come back and say that we were wrong. <laughs> we reserve the right to change our minds when you prove us wrong. <laughs> right. So this is a question, you know, the FTC has done a series of merger retrospectives. What happened? Were we right or wrong? And how did prices turn out? And I think that that's important for them to do, to see were there bad actions that took place or other things that came about as a result of a merger, but not were we wrong in the merger decision? And I think that's something that makes it very difficult to say, oh, your merger is never really completed. 
because we always have the right to come back and review it later. And that's going to cause, I think the FTC has a difficult case. Monopolization cases are difficult. Reversing a merger that you approved 5 nothing is going to be very difficult. And both of these cases will become more difficult with the judicial appointments that tend to be over the past few years that have tended to be more market oriented and more skeptical to regulatory arguments. Well, you know, people who think that there are just too many mergers, period, might think that making the government's commitment of saying that the merger is okay with a decision, even a 5-0 decision, making that not credible anymore might be a good thing because it might make companies more hesitant to merger. Hesit- they would yeah, make them less likely to want to merge because it could be undone. So I think one of my dissertation advisors was Bill Baxter, who Mm -hmm. was really the father of the modern merger guidelines Mm -hmm. when he was assistant attorney general for antitrust. And one of his arguments was, hey, we need to give some certainty to business, a framework and certainty to make sure things work. So they know when they're stepping over the line and when they're not stepping over the line. So we can have efficiency enhancing mergers and not have anti-competitive mergers. I think this is an important piece of framework that we put forth so companies can know what to expect and they can know when to merge and not merge. You're right that if we kind of make the line fuzzy and move the line against mergers, we'll get fewer mergers. You're absolutely right on that. But is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think depends on your point of view. Right. And I think a lot of people right now would think that's a good thing. People who are sort of coming into taking office now. So even just questioning the merger and questioning a pre-decision, they might see as a win. So I think there are other ways to do it that don't create the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. For example, burden shifting might be a different way of doing that. Right now, to challenge a merger, the burden is on the agencies. And this is something that happened in the AT&T T-Mobile merger that had to clear both FCC and DOJ approval. The DOJ filed suit and it had to go to court and prove that this was an anti-competitive merger. At the FCC, the parties had to prove that it was in the public interest. So the burden was on the parties to come to the FCC and say, this is in the public interest. And the parties had said they were going to challenge the DOJ in court. And then the FCC came up with a staff report that said, we don't think this is in the public interest. And here's what we're going to show. And you're going to have to overcome this burden. Mm -hmm. And the parties then dropped the merger. So I think there is a difference in you could shift the burden, have legislation or something that says we're going to shift the burden. And that would be easier. I don't, you know, by graying out the area and other things like that, you still have to get through the court system. So I don't see it as, unless you have legislation, I don't see things shifting quickly towards more skepticism of mergers simply because somebody thinks there's a bad idea because parties can challenge them like T-Mobile and AT&T did when they were challenged in court and they both won. You know, that suggests a kind of a, an interesting paper. I mean, when the burden of proof is different at the FCC compared to elsewhere, there are a way to compare the outcomes of different mergers under the different scenarios. Not necessarily whether the mergers went through, because if you have another veto point, the fewer are going to go through, but how the firms did, for example, right. what competition in the industry looks like afterwards. Right. I think you do have the endogeneity problem which yeah. is, or selection right. problem, because the firms, knowing that the FCC have to approve a merger, might change their willingness to even propose a merger. In AT&T Time Warner, they actually sold off one television station, the one television station they own. So all of a sudden, the merger did not have any radio licenses changing hands. So they avoided FCC review. Well, I think on that note, we should probably wrap up. So, Greg, thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you guys for having me. Sure. Thanks, Greg.